So anyway, just a bit of background. I'm a lawyer who advises Chinese companies on their investments in India. So that's what I do, regardless of what I speak and uh, whatever I've done in the last one year. So today I'll just give you a brief introduction about uh, what is happening with Chinese companies in India, what are they doing, what are the challenges they face, uh, and anything else related to that. So uh, a bit of context, India and China both fill in the top 10 uh, both in terms of inflows and outflows. So we are also investors and we also receive FDI, which makes uh, study of uh, FDI between China and India that much more important uh, at a global scale. And uh, this is a recent phenomenon, uh, Chinese investments in India. So here I just uh, you know, outlined the stages where the first two stages, India was not a party because uh, Chinese were not investing in India until about 2000. Even then, there was a trickle and it really started in 2010. So it's market seeking, uh, that's the category, because India is a big market, it's a <coughs> tested market for uh, Chinese products. Now, uh, this uh, matches with the trend of Chinese ODI overall, because uh, this ODI has diversified uh, since 2005. Earlier it was very concentrated, uh, but now it has diversified, it, you know, if you look at 2015, I think now ODI has surpassed FDI into China. So there's more investment going out of China than that is coming into China. Uh, these are some of the countries where uh, Chinese ODI goes. This is important because then I'll place India into the context and say how it fits in. Right. So now I come to this hypothesis which I have uh, tried to test in my thesis, it's a master's thesis in China. So the hypothesis is that India is, uh, uh, Chinese investments in India are uh, at a grossly inadequate level, it's underinvested. And the reason for this is, uh, if you look at determinants of Chinese ODI, there are a few motivating factors for Chinese ODI all over the world. And these are, this is done in a paper by Buckley in 2007. It is the first statistical study of Chinese investments worldwide. So these are the factors that emerged. Uh, so you can see what is a positive correlation and what is a negative correlation. And uh, there are some surprises. Uh, for example, a political risk. So if we say that okay, China and India, there's a lot of political risk, then immediately if you look at this data, you will find that Chinese investment actually goes up when there's political risk. So, for example, in Africa, where no one dares to invest, Chinese investment is quite heavy. And uh, so that is also because there are some strategic reasons. But this is the only statistical study we have to go by. So I've just tested this out with this. So everything else, uh, I've put those tick marks because India meets those criteria. Uh, market size, uh, uh, your FDI policy. This policy is actually a... Uh, it's, it's a proxy. I've said 1992 because the statistical study actually used 1992 reforms as the test. But right now we can say like in 2013 or 2014 when uh, Xi Jinping came to power, that was when actually India became a big part of the OBOR and you know, sort of emerged on the horizon. So that is a proxy. So what was true in 1992, you can say in 2013 there was one more government policy from the Chinese side, which promoted investments into India. So that box is thick. Oops, it's not my day here. I'm only good with technology. Today, I don't know. The machine is on me. Machine went on. Machine went on. Oh, this one? Oh, OK. So, OK, so the second stage of that study, when it appears, you will see that I uh, looked out for theories uh, to see what are the traditional sources of FDI into India. So one is to test what encourages Chinese money to move outside China and the other one is whether it will come to India to look at other places from where India traditionally gets its FDI. So I found this paper uh, done by IAM uh, Ahmedabad, I think, a uh, research paper which uh, did again a very similar statistical study which is why I chose it because it exactly mirrored Buckley's uh, methodology. Uh, so that said that most of the investments that come into India are from large economies 
with large populations, large markets. So it basically, in a way, described China. So that again helped uh, enabled me to uh, support this hypothesis, saying that if you look at it from a theoretical context, there should be a lot more Chinese investment in India, both from looking at China as a source and India as a destination. Okay. Should I just switch to PPT? Maybe that's just the solution. So this this is uh, this is what we uh, I saw. Uh, see GDP per capita, if it's growing, it's a positive correlation. So which means that as China's per capita GDP grew, Chinese investments in India should have grown. GDP of the host country, India has been growing. Population of the source country, distance between source country and India. So China takes all these boxes. So it's very difficult to explain why Chinese investments are very low in India. So now after this hypothesis. I moved on to see why is Chinese investment low in India. So first I established it ought to be higher. Uh, this is just an illustration, Brazil. Uh, yesterday, we, I think in one discussion we used Brazil. So it has one-fifth of our population. It doesn't import as much as we do from uh, China. Yet it has 30 times more Chinese investment. So that again, that's just an illustration. So now coming to uh, India-China space, uh, this I think many, most people are familiar. There's a huge imbalance in trade between India and China. It's been the focus of a lot of uh, attention from the government as well. Uh, so the interesting story here is, uh, as Chinese exports grew, uh, what happened was their margins started decreasing. In 2000, every Chinese company used to make comfortable 20% margin in India. And today it's you know it's low single digits. If one Chinese company is selling something, there are another hundred Chinese companies selling the same thing, which has resulted in the rock bottom prices. So Chinese companies can't continue this. So they have to invest or they have to vacate the market. And India is too big a market to ignore. So they started investing. So this is what happened in about 2008, when the financial crisis uh, took hold of the West. Uh, their exports markets in the West uh, kind of plateaued. So they said, okay, let's focus on India now. It's been giving us good business, but the margins are low. And how do you increase the margins? By doing backward integration <coughs> and investing in the market, which is closer to the consumers. So that's, what, that's how it started in 2008, 2009. And then this year, uh, this exciting event happened, or will happen. Uh, if you, depending on whether you look at IMF or World Bank or any other Euro monitors. So this is like a big flag for Chinese companies, you know, because they're so used to looking at GDP growth at provincial level, city level, national level. So suddenly if India becomes like a country which is growing faster than China, it's almost like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like saying everyone just has to go there. You either be there or you be dead. So this, this year, so this is, this explains a little bit of the craziness, you know. I think there have been delegations from 13 provinces. It, it's broken many records, you know, in terms of uh, how you measure interest uh, from China and India. So the last uh, 12 months or 18 months, it, it has coincided with uh, Modi's coming into power. It has coincided with the uh, OBOR, uh, Xi Jinping finished his, uh, you know, power consolidation and he started focusing on OBOR. So it's coincided with a lot of things. And uh, it has all come together in the last 12 to 18 months. Sir. Sorry. Yeah. One, one question. That's a sure. Sir, uh, sir uh, the India's GDP has grown uh, more than the China. I mean, there was a reason because uh, the GDP calculator was changed from CPI to WPI. Mm -hmm. So that okay. was the reason, I think. Yeah, we had that discussion. Uh, there are, of course, India, uh, I think, uh, uh, the economic uh, advisor, I think, has explained this at length about yeah. how India changed its uh, sort of way of measuring GDP and all that. Let's not go into that technical detail because at the end of the day, what will that, that will happen is, if this has not happened this year, it will happen next year. I mean, that's basically the, I mean, so there's, let's not spend a great deal of time on discussing that. 
But this year or next year, I think the annual GDP rate of India will surpass that of China because China is slowing down. They are planning to slow down, so that will happen. And Whether it will happen this year or next year is debated. Uh, don't you think the, the 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 GDP that is that will be predicted by China is deliberate? Means the thing is they are. I mean, it's not that China is slowing down. It's that I mean they are um, focusing more on the domestic base, not on the international base. That's sure, that will be the reason. Sure, the reasons are many. Reasons are many. We are not getting into reasons here. What I'm just saying is this has a signaling effect. Due to whatever reasons, if the fact is that India is going to have a higher GDP next year, annual growth rate, compared to China, then that's a signal for all Chinese companies saying the action has moved to India. So that is the place to be there. So it's a signaling effect. It's, you know, many Chinese companies don't even think whether their actual product or they have a sort of advantage in the Indian market. They just look at this and say now India is the place to be. So it's a signaling effect. It's not really, it's not going to actually impact each and every business because not much can change in the space of one or two years just because of some number of changing. Okay, so now we come to this uh, billion dollar question. Uh, so that's a play on words because uh, it's widely believed that there's a billion dollars uh, from China floating around in India. Uh, so uh, you can, sort of agree with it, disagree with it. My own estimate is it's at least three times this. I think Chinese investment in India is far higher than this number. Simply because I, I just go by anecdotal kind of experience. Our law firm in the last five years, I think has advised more than a billion dollars of investment coming into India. So uh, so this is a statistical anomaly. Uh, this because data is not relevant to the data? I'll, I'll get to the data. I'll, I'll go to what data is available and why it has uh, sort of holes in it. So we'll get to that. So uh, this is the question. So many people say, what is the actual level of Chinese investment? Uh, anywhere between one to three billion, you can say. Uh, but uh, yeah, so whether it can be characterized as Chinese investment, that's the next question. So I'll just uh, take you here. So this is the data from Chinese government. Since 1970, there have been 311 investment projects which have been approved by the Chinese government for investment in India. Uh, this was because until 2013, uh, they needed Chinese government approval to invest in India. Uh, now it's no longer the case and not just for India, in any country. So India, uh, Chinese ODI regulations have uh, been reformed and you no longer require approval. So after 2013, this statistic is useless. So it ends in 2013. But anyway, for what it's worth, uh, this is what uh, you can see for India. Up to 1999, it's zero. And then there's one, there's two, 13, 22, 22. So it's gone up. Uh, so this uh, this is good quality data. So it, is, it can be break, uh, broken down into provinces. So you will see that uh, the <coughs> central government SOEs are a, a big player in India. Uh, then there are the heavy uh, industrial uh, sort of bases from these provinces here. Uh, so now, what is the problem with this data? The problem with this data is it doesn't measure whether the investment actually arrived in India. It left the station there. So some company went to the Chinese government and submitted a report and said, I want to invest in India and this is what I will do. Please approve the foreign exchange so that I can take it out. But it never arrived in India, for sure. At least the RBI uh, has not tracked it. Uh, so this is what the RBI has. So if you go to RBI's website, you will find a paper saying Chinese investments in India. And this is the data they have. From 2000 to 2014, if you add up all this, it's I think uh, barely uh, 400, 300, 400 million. And this, uh, there are, uh, this is because they only track money which leaves China and comes to India without going to any other destination. And unfortunately, money doesn't move in that manner. Uh, because for Chinese companies, if they have made profits in, say, some other country, they would like to reinvest it in a third country, rather than take it back to China. So it doesn't happen like, you know, we have a stash of cash, it goes somewhere, comes back, and then goes again. So they move around money in much more efficiency. So, and this is true of every country. It's not about Chinese companies or anything. So, which is why this is, you know, barely capturing one-tenth of the actual Chinese investment in India. 
So in fact, if you look at this, some of the major Chinese companies like Huawei, largest Chinese investor, it doesn't figure in the RBI list. So this is the problem with statistics in India. So the truth lies somewhere in between. It is not as much as is recorded in China. It is not as much as is recorded in India as being received. It is somewhere in between. These companies have to be incorporated, right? Yes, they have to be incorporated. So if you, if you go into the articles of incorporation, mm -hmm. don't you get to know what Chinese equity is? No. <laughs> That's an interesting question because uh, MCA, uh, <laughs> the Ministry of Company Affairs website, if you go, and uh, just enter the name of any Chinese city. And you will find 30, 40 companies from Chongqi. And if you look at the uh, source of capital, it's come from all over the world. It has not come from China. But the name of the company is Chongqi something something. So you know, you know it's a Chinese company, you know it's a company from Chongqi. But the money has not come from China. So it's not tracked as Chinese investment. So if the money comes, I understand it's yeah. not being aggregated. Yeah, yeah, it's not being aggregated, but yeah. it's possible to access the data. It, it is, is possible, but it can never be exhaustive. And this is just one category of companies. And I will go to acquisitions. Acquisitions are impossible to track because you don't even have to register a company and actually uh, go to RBI and file form FCGPR because you are just buying shares of India. <coughs> So, yeah, there are problems, it can never be exhaustive, but you can get closer to the answer, you can uh, poke holes and say, this is why this is missing, this is why this is missing, and all that. But, anyway, so one more way of looking at it is uh, combining Hong Kong and China. So this will get you closer to the picture, because uh, at least until last five years, most of Chinese investment came to India. If they were not coming directly from China, they were coming from uh, Hong Kong. But now this has changed. Now it's coming from everywhere, uh, all across the world, all kinds of uh, jurisdictions. So I'll stop here on the statistical side and I will move to some uh, models which I created. <coughs> uh, this was also part of that ICS talk I did a couple of months ago. So I think Arvind and Arka can ignore it. And I think someone yesterday told me I was planning to attend that I missed it. So. So this is the same slide. So last night I changed a few slides, but I uh, left most of the slides intact. So uh, these 300 companies which I've been mentioned from China, what do they do in India? They all open an office and sit and look for customers. So they have young English speaking uh, Chinese moving all around India uh, and trying to sell their products. And these products are not products. They're you know, big machinery, big uh, whatever contracting services, they can be everything. So this is how most things uh, operate in India. Unfortunately, this is the least successful opportunity for India, uh, Chinese companies because it's riddled with uh, a kind of, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's bound to fail. And the reason for that is, if you get into the psyche of an Indian company, which looks at a Chinese company, it doesn't induce any kind of confidence. No matter how big a Chinese company is, if they have such a small setup here with like one or two people staying in India and trying to visit with some brochures and trying to sell equipment worth you know, millions of dollars, it doesn't work. Any, any Indian company, if they're spending a million dollars, they will have to go to China, look at their plant and you know, sort of a lot of questions. This whole perception of, of what Chinese will sell will invariably be junk, it will never work, and there's no after sales support. So this model is you know, bound to fail. But for whatever reasons, uh, Chinese companies, uh, almost like the herd mentality, they have been doing this as a default. Indian market is very big, and the low cost approach to Indian market is this. So even if we fail, it's fine, we have a presence there. So this is, uh, it's changing now. But this is what we have today. And this mostly happens in uh, suburban areas, Gurgaon, and in many other cities in India, in uh, Navi Mumbai, in Bombay. So a lot of Chinese companies kind of gather there. And they have their own restaurants and hotels and uh, you know, whatever they need. So uh, this is what's happening. This is the most common approach. Uh, this is another interesting uh, approach adopted by large Chinese companies. Uh, the company itself doesn't do anything, but it uh, deputes 
a couple of managers, mid-level managers, to go as proxies and test out the market. If they fail, then the company has plausible deniability, saying that we never entered India, so we couldn't have possibly failed in India. And if they succeed, then they will take over whatever these people have created. So this is, you know, the Chinese love this. They think this is like the smartest way to enter the Indian market because the uh, Indian market can either be, it's a high risk, high uh, growth market. So a lot of state-owned enterprises informally do this. Uh, it's not a secret, they talk about it, so I have no forms uh, disclosing these kind of methods they employ. Uh, so you see, uh, and that's where all these passports come out, you know, one has a public passport, one has a private passport, so they enter with a private passport because they don't want to say that I'm representing my company. Although they're on the roles of that company, they'll come as private individuals and with, you know, uh, with money, literally boards of money to sustain themselves because they can't get a remittance from the and company. Tourist visa? No, visa visa is no longer a problem because business visa now, uh, if you apply in, uh, you get it in two days. You get it in two days. Earlier that might have been a problem, maybe 10 years ago, 8 years ago. But at least in the last 5 years, visas are not a big problem because business visas are given pretty free. And right now I think the NBC has a commitment saying 48 hours your visa will be given. And it's working. So, they get the right visas. Uh, and uh, this is, they're not doing, uh, let me just clarify, they're not doing anything illegal here. It's just a tactic to conceal the name of the real company and to protect it from uh, loss of reputation. So if whatever these individuals try fails, the company is not involved. So it's not nothing illegal, it's just a tactic. So uh, It's like investment by agent. It's by, yeah, investment by agent, they're proxy basically. They do the business of the company in their own name. Uh, so, yeah. This is the sec other model, uh, EPC to investment. A lot of Chinese companies in India are contractors, you know, uh, in uh, steel plants, cement plants, all kinds of plants. They're EPC uh, uh, sort of package contractors. And for these companies, EPC contracts is normally a first step towards investment. Uh, if they have one successful EPC project, they move on to a second or third one and at some point of time they make a huge investment. And this is how they work around the world. Uh, unfortunately in India, uh, due to a combination of reasons, uh, EPC contractors have not been very successful. Uh, very few have been successful in fact. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, EPC contracts in India especially large scale ones, are played by delays. Even if it's completely contained within a private premises and nothing to do with the public infrastructure, it is still played by delays. So if you start constructing a plant and say I'll finish it in two years, it normally takes three to four. Uh, so at the end of that, uh, and they're extremely price sensitive. Uh, so most of these companies win these tenders on price. So if a project for two years spills over to three or four, uh, the profits are basically negative. Uh, so this doesn't give them a good uh, starting point to plan their investments. So they just either they retreat or they bid for more projects at a higher cost and saying that I will not undercut and get this contract because there's no money to be made. So this is one more model which has failed. The way to make this a success is to do an MA because doing an MA means the Chinese contractor will actually pick up a stake in an Indian contractor and use his uh, sort of network of clients and uh, reputation to uh, uh, undertake contracts, to bid and undertake contracts, and that can be profitable. That can be extremely profitable. <coughs> because uh, most of the risk is undertaken by the Indian company and the Chinese company sticks to what it can do best, which is either supply the technology or the engineering skill for large scale projects, which Indian companies might not have. So this is slowly changing, uh, it might work better. Uh, this is the common approach. Most success stories between India and China uh, currently are, I think, uh, maybe most of them, or at least 50% of them, are in this category. This is this suits the yesterday. I think we were talking. What happens when 
there, there are so many similarities between Indian and Chinese companies, but what happens when they both have to negotiate with each other? So they somehow uh, come to an arrangement, it's a joint venture, it's basically based on common sense, there's no sophisticated planning or projections, it is just like a promoter from here and a promoter from there shake hands and they try to make something out of it. Uh, these things fail because they are not carefully planned uh, and Indians normally, you know, they like to make it up as they go and Chinese want complete clarity. So then each party compromises, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's a difficult marriage to sort of continue. So they go, they do well for a couple of years, uh, they, the top line goes up and then they try to launch new products and they can't do something terribly innovative. Something that the Indian company has been doing for many years, if the Chinese company agrees with that, this will work very well. But after joining hands, if they want to do something new, that is when normally these things fail. So this has been the experience. I don't want to take too many names here uh, for obvious reasons, but uh, you know, I think in the background you can see some names here. So this was taken from actual uh, signing ceremony. Uh, 2015, with all the excitement you know, of uh, startups in India, uh, Chinese players have taken a plunge into this area as well. Uh, the, I mean, as we discussed, the valuations are already sky high. Uh, so my sense as a sort of professional advisor is this appeals to the Chinese uh, liking for gambling. This is not business. They, they are just trying to gamble and see what because I don't think after having met so many Chinese companies, I don't think they have a nuanced understanding of how the Indian startup ecosystem works. They know that, okay, the US it works very well and of course in China itself uh, there have been a lot of uh, good startups which have made a lot of money. So they know this, this sort of phenomenon works. So they are taking a bet and they are matching business models. So Alibaba has found a few uh, business models here that matches with them. Tencent has found a few business models that matches with their business. So these sort of uh, initial pioneers I think they'll probably do well because they, they are very familiar with the business model. But then there are a lot of other second string Chinese companies which are also looking at startups. So that's where I say this is just gambling. Because they don't know what they're doing, they just want to just play the market and see what will happen. It's good for Indian companies, of course, if capital is coming from China, it's great. Now uh, this slide I use because uh, if you leave out internet startups, that kind of space, most of the investments can be categorized as greenfield <coughs> or m &A. And this is a conventional kind of investment plan process. And for mm -hmm. Chinese companies, 9 out of 10 times the m &A approach is far more preferred. Uh, whether they see it or not, uh, I think uh, this is what uh, experience shows. And if you list, list out the factors, even you know, people who are not familiar with the space can put their fingers and say why this will work. Uh, greenfield projects uh, are incredibly complex in India. Uh, it requires even Indian companies, you know, uh, you know, are frightened of having a greenfield project in India because uh, delays and you know, things might get better. Better, it's all relative, uh, but still, uh, greenfield remains a challenge here. Acquisitions on the other hand, uh, uh, it's easy to start off, but integration is a challenge. Uh, that's where I'll come, to late, uh, I'll come to it later about you know, a lot of what is happening here with your program will fit into this very nicely. Uh, integration is a huge challenge for Chinese companies in India. Uh, so when you do m and the integration can be you know, can stretched up to five years after the actual investment. And that's where, you know, mid-level managers and the work, you know, the entire, the whole entire business has to be integrated. And that's a human resource challenge, it's, it's nothing else. The government has nothing to do with it, uh, the, the decision makers have very little control over it. So it's all down to, you know, the business units to integrate. So... How many MNAs have happened, just as a ballpark scale? Are we talking in hundreds, are we talking in thousands? Oh, I think at least about 50. 
Uh, well, this year we have done at least about 10 to 15. Uh, one, uh, what is rare is public MA. Uh, because private MA is impossible to track. But I can tell you this year we advised one listed Chinese company to acquire a stake in an Indian listed company. So this is rare. I think two or three have happened in the entire sort of uh, history. So public MA is a good indication of uh, investment phenomenon coming of age. Uh, private uh, can happen all the time and it's happening uh, pretty uh, regularly now. I mean, we get inquiries on a weekly basis. And, uh, so, what are those companies? Sorry? Do you think company MA and publicly happen? Yeah, so I'll come to it later. I have like a case study section because uh, there's a lot of demand for stories. Lawyers <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, don't like to tell stories. <laughs> I would rather go by something that can be explained easily, clearly, supporting. Uh, so I conducted a survey amongst uh, uh, Chinese companies investing in India. This was part of my uh, work for the thesis. And uh, it threw up these factors as the biggest challenges faced by Chinese companies in India. It is quite common. I mean, for other companies also work. Yes, yes, yes. This again goes to the this thing, the support my thesis that the reason why Chinese companies are not investing in as large numbers in India is not because of any special reason. Uh, people have this feeling that there's something between India and China which is preventing them. It's not. These are common reasons. You know, no, no, nobody said that uh, there's some political issue. There's no, no, no one says that anymore. Ten years ago, they might have said it. So yeah, these are very common issues, but there is some, some Chinese characteristics in this. For example, difficulty in finding reliable Indian business partner. This is code for saying that India doesn't have a significant overseas Chinese population. <coughs> because in the US, the early stage Chinese investors relied on overseas Chinese, you know, these China towns all across the US were actually the hubs from where Chinese investment grew. So India, we don't have that ecosystem. So that's actually code for saying difficulty because it's difficult for Chinese to actually come to India and find reliable business partners. And if there was an overseas Chinese population, this would have been so much more easier to do the networks. Poor reputation, this is something that bothers Chinese companies a lot. And uh, I mean, I'm not sure who's the root of the problem, but Indians generally have a very poor perception of Chinese companies. Even a very successful Chinese company with a very good standing across the world, if it comes to India, A, nobody recognizes it, and B, they keep mistaking it for a Korean company or a Japanese company. And the minute that company says we're a Chinese company, they go from here to here. And uh, this is a great concern and uh, for the Chinese embassy in India and for these companies themselves. It's a great concern and uh, so who is to blame? Uh, I mean, I think a little bit of both sides because Indian traders have been going and buying junk from China, uh, lying on the docks, rejected uh, goods from Europe. Indian traders buy it at zero cost and bring it to India and sell it as Chinese stock. You get like a plastic bucket for 10 rupees. You get something else for 50 rupees. So you can't even manufacture that for that cost. But it's coming here because Indians are seeking it. It's not like Chinese are selling that. Indians want that. So we have done this for the last 20 years and we have kind of put ourselves in the corner where China has become synonymous with the low quality and cheap for Indians. And uh, the Chinese can't be blamed because they will never allow anyone to go on the satisfied. If someone says, you give me something for a dollar, they'll give them for a dollar. They'll make the same thing. It, it won't work for more than 10 days. But they'll never let a customer go empty-handed. So who's to blame for this? We don't know. <coughs> but uh, this is a big challenge. So for big Chinese companies, world-class companies who come to India, they face this a lot. And, uh, and I think India loses a lot because of this, because uh, Indian, big Indian companies who are very well traveled, very well read, even they fail to see the difference between any common Chinese company and a big established world player. So, uh, yeah. So this political equation 
uh, figured in a different question in the same survey. When I said what will improve Chinese investment, they said if the political relationship improves. And actually now I think that has happened with uh, uh, Xi Jinping visiting India and Modi visiting China within the space of a year. I think now I think this is settled and uh, most companies have uh, uh, are fairly comfortable investing in India. Uh, this was another finding. Uh, this uh, goes to support something I'll say in the next slide. Uh, I mean, the, I'm, I'm just highlighting this because my thesis was for a law school. So I had to put certain questions about the legal system and this is generally the sort of uh, summary of that. So now coming to the challenges. Uh, I have categorized these challenges in this manner. Political, institutional factors and human environment factors. Uh, now political I think we can put it aside. Uh, legal I will not go into because uh, this is not an audience uh, that can, I think I can do justice here. So I will just deal with management and culture because I think uh, that is more suitable for this setting. So when, when we talk about management styles, uh, I think uh, we were having a discussion saying there is no, uh, there is insufficient preparation among both Indians and Chinese uh, to manage a business in a truly Asian style. So we rely excessively on Western theories of management, ideas of management, strategy, you, you name it and it's all Western. So uh, the Japanese, for example, have very, very unique management styles, uh, whether it's man, uh, measuring efficiency or delegation, and all kinds of techniques that have been developed by the Japanese. But unfortunately, uh, uh, there's very little uh, uptake of those techniques. So between India and China, what normally happens in a typical scenario is a Chinese company uh, finds it very difficult to uh, so, uh, okay, these are the institutional challenges. As I said, I will not go into this because uh, this will take it in a completely different way. So this is what I'm, I want to focus on. So Chinese companies, they try to recruit top Indian talent. And they try. Uh, they match uh, salaries, they recruit from the top Indian companies. But the top managers in India uh, don't like to work for Chinese companies. And even if they do take up these assignments, they don't like this suffocating management style because they are used to a lot of autonomy. An uh, Indian manager with 15 to 20 years experience can do a lot of things independently. He can even go and stitch up deals on his own with a high level of sort of delegation. So this doesn't work in the Chinese context because uh, you know, we were talking about top-down decision making. Uh, especially the investment planning process. I am focusing on that. I am not so much uh, of a sort of, I am not familiar with operational issues, but I am sure that, uh, there are similar issues. But at least from the investment planning process, it simply doesn't work. Because investment planning is uh, quite centralized in most Chinese companies. Uh, same as they are, I think, even in Indian companies. But it's just that when Indian managers work for Chinese companies, it's, it takes a different color. Because it's in the Indian market where a Chinese uh, chairman or a CEO is trying to tell an Indian manager how to invest in India. So it becomes quite complicated. And, uh, and uh, on the other hand, good Chinese managers, you know, some Chinese companies have invested in like 80 to 100 countries in the world, uh, the, the, the biggest Chinese companies. So they have a lot of expertise in foreign markets. So they have a good quality Chinese managers who have grown in these in the international markets. But they will never move to India. And this is the sad truth because uh, India doesn't offer what they expect in terms of standard of living or uh, education for the children. Uh, these people are in their mid 40s. Uh, they can speak fairly good English. They have lived abroad for most of their career. And they will refuse to relocate to India. <coughs> So this is again where the Chinese company faces a lot of problems because this is, these are the kind of people they would like to have in India who are Chinese, who have helped the Chinese company grow in other markets and then they are coming to India as a new challenge. But that doesn't happen. Isn't this a sort of initial trust? I mean the Korean companies have the same issues. Yeah, yeah. But now Samsung has been taken over by Apple and they have gone over that hump. Yeah. So, 
to me, this seems like China's advancing. This is this is this is all the transition because this phenomenon is very recent. You know, until 2010, uh, this was not a serious. Also, yeah. would rather because they are relatively new living abroad, so they would rather enjoy yeah. the Western so, yeah. Uh, so country. Yeah, so yeah, I was just telling you. Yeah, I was just uh, speaking <laughs> with uh, Mel Rana. So, right about now, I think the. The longest living expat from China and India is reaching about 8 years. So there's a community called Orchid Petals in Gurgaon, where there are dozens of Chinese families from Huawei and ZTE who live. And the most experienced of them are now approaching about 8 years or maybe 10 years because Huawei came to India in 1999. So this pool has been created by Huawei. So for every Chinese company in India now, the best catch is to get someone from Huawei. Uh, ZTE not so much because ZTE is state owned, but uh, Huawei uh, has more uh, kind of talent that they would like. So yes, it's a it's in transition. It's a new and phenomenon. We'll get better. By giving hardship allowances and all sorts of things which companies yes, have done they, they, they do. when they, they posted them in China in the 90s, oh, all US companies were paying hardship yeah. allowances yeah. for them. Even Indian staff yeah. to go work in China. No, absolutely. I think uh, uh, for Chinese, uh, even in the diplomatic community as well as the business community, India is harsh. Uh, so there's no doubt about it. So I, I think uh, the companies at least can definitely compensate for hardship. And they, What's the hardship about? Uh, hardship is uh, uh, access to. Uh, I mean, if you see how they live, uh, I mean, we visit them often. Uh, they're friends. Uh, they normally don't go out. In Gurgaon, they go to the nearest mall. Uh, if they come to New Delhi, uh, they have company cars which ferry them on the weekend. So two families or two couples get into a car on Saturday morning and come to Delhi from Gurgaon, spend the whole day and then go back in the evening. Uh, they don't dare drive. Uh, I mean, even I find it scary to drive. Is the driving culture scary? Sorry? The yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's everything. It's uh, uh, education. Uh, if they come here, their children can't be educated in Mandarin. The Indian government hasn't even today allowed the uh, Hanban to set up centers in India. Uh, and uh, so mm -hmm. it, it's education. It's uh, health, uh, health facilities. It's convenience. It's you know driving. It's safety. It's, it's a big thing. With every rape in India is broadcast. You know. On live television in China, so uh, so it's a it's a lot of things, but uh, so it's still considered hardship, and there are very few people who will come with families. It's a change in picture. Chinese diplomats. It was unthinkable that Chinese diplomat would drive a car in Delhi. Yes. Now they do. Totally changed. They are all driving their own cars. Yes. 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 Uh, official cars. Sure. sure. Official cars. We don't permit this uh, in our system, yeah. uh, which is a foolish way of thinking we have. So we have to pay horribly large uh, official driver salaries, etc. They permit that if you manage to drive official cars and they become that way much more, you know, comfortable with the environment. So as Kushi says, this is a change in picture. Yeah, this changes, yes, I think diplomats find it much easier because within China Kipuri, I think they feel much more comfortable taking out their cars. But if you ask someone to drive on Gurgaon and, or at least go from Gurgaon to Noida or some stretch like that, it's a bit daunting. And other cities like uh, where Chinese live, like in Pune, uh, Pune or Chennai or even Bangalore, you know, the, tr the pressure on infrastructure is much more actually severe. I would say Gurgaon is still a, a millennium city, so it's it's, it's, it's quite okay. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's one aspect of it. It's changing. How is it changing? But there's also, I think, underlying all of the physical <coughs> reasons for why it's a hardship for state. I think there's also the attitudinal issue. Yeah. That you know, if I'm going to be on a foreign post state, Correct. my prestige is better Absolutely. if I'm in America or Absolutely. Europe. Absolutely. And yeah. rather than I get posted to yeah. India. So and vice versa, for Indians too. Absolutely. Yeah. For Indians too. Yeah. And uh, this is also linked to immigration because uh, you know, when I was doing my MBA in China, all my classmates, their burning issues that they would discuss in the evening typically is which country to immigrate. So they have a pecking order. It goes like you, it goes like US, <laughs> Canada, Australia, uh, maybe Singapore. UK maybe or even any European country and India somehow 
I, I didn't press them for like top 20 <laughs> because even then if India doesn't figure it's quite embarrassing. So, yeah. So, yes. I cannot this, conceive of any reason why a Chinese national would want to enter the country. Exactly. So, so, that is actually a challenge because most of these Chinese when they uh, move abroad for work, whether it's for three years or five years, eventually what they're trying to do is get a passport. Uh, so, some people have special arrangements where they spend six months in Australia, come back to China because they have to live in Australia for two years, three years, within a period of five years or something like that. So, so it's very complicated. So, moving the Chinese expats around is uh, quite a big uh, concern for them. So, what are the other challenges? Yeah, less research. Yeah. So, Indians plan their businesses on a more sort of flexible manner. Uh, Chinese absolutely can't live with it because they are technocrats, uh, their decisions are driven by what is this technology and this is the market, how do we take it? And step by step they have to sort of, uh, you know, populate this plan. Uh, for the Indians it's like, let's decide how to do it. You put in this, I put in this and let's then take it forward. So, uh, well, a typical India-China business <coughs> negotiation is uh, it's quite a unique show. I mean, before I moved to China, I thought I'd seen the world. I've done, I've done MA in South America, in Europe, in the US, in Southeast Asia. But uh, China is a different world. I mean, if you put Chinese decision makers with Indian decision makers, you never know what will come out. <laughs> it's, it's completely, you know, it's. Uh, so let, let's go to the case studies. So these are some case studies. I've uh, chosen. Uh, each one for a different reason. Uh, they're all my clients. Uh, Sinoma is the largest Chinese government investor in India. They've done two acquisitions. Now they're thinking of the third one. They're the world's largest uh, cement engineering company. They have a market, global market share of about 40%, 42%. So, so uh, India was or is still is the largest growing, uh, fastest growing cement market in the world. So for them, uh, it was imperative that they get a footprint in India. They tried for a couple of years, failed, and they decided to go uh, the acquisition route. And uh, they acquired a majority stake in a company in Chennai in 2012, 2012, 2013, uh, in the November, December period. And uh, this, this was a very interesting thing because this is a government company. Uh, they're not very nimble, they're not private. They have invested in at least 100 countries worldwide. They are one of the largest companies in China. They are in the top uh, 117 that he mentioned, centrally governed companies. So this was fascinating to see this uh, mammoth company do a small, tiny M&A deal in India. Because the amount they invested actually was insignificant. They, I think invested a little more than $3 million or something. But it was insignificant. It was like a... It was like loose change for the company. But the amount of resources that they had to put into this transaction because it was in India was quite uh, astonishing. A lot of resources, a lot of departments were involved. We negotiated in Beijing in the winter and then we came back to Chennai and went back to Beijing and the Indian company was just, you know, were fascinated just to see this Chinese company operate. It was a, a pretty small entrepreneur driven uh, company uh, from someone from IIT who had started this company 10 years ago and established uh, himself in the sort of uh, cement engineering space. So today uh, when I spoke to them last, you know, last month, they told me that our business has done well, the market has not picked up as much as we hoped, but our profit has increased. So this is actually quite common. Any Chinese company invests in an Indian company, the profitability is bound to go up because uh, uh, what Chinese companies are good at is the, the, this kind of lean operations. They're very good at it. They kind of remove all the bells and whistles and make it efficient. And that is something Indian companies don't pay too much attention to. Uh, Indian companies will look at a minimum margin that they need to protect and anything beyond that is really a luxury because it takes a lot of effort to get that 21st percentage of profit. So if your 20% profit is secure, the sort of uh, the drive to chase that further profit is quite limited. But Chinese companies are relentless. They will chase even the 0.1% of profit after that. 
So this is a, this is a case study. So then later they did one more acquisition, which was of a mining equipment <coughs> company. That was a global acquisition with uh, India as uh, one part of it. Uh, by that time they had learned a lot of lessons. So the second one was much smoother. They felt much more confident going into that. Now they're looking at a third one, and uh, let's see what happens. So that was one case. Uh, TBA I mentioned because uh, it's the second largest uh, Chinese investor in India. And it's a very successful one. It's a private company. Uh, they have a transformer plant in uh, Baroda. And now they have diversified into uh, solar and uh, real estate even. So TBA is a poster child. Uh, if you ask the Indian embassy in Beijing also, they will say TBA is like a good example. And, uh, so it's good, uh, it gets good press. Uh, TBA gets good press because uh, their business has grown phenomenally and it's a complete Chinese operation. It's not a joint venture, it's not an acquisition. So if any Chinese company says Indian market is difficult, the uh, Indian embassy or CII can immediately talk about TBA. Uh, but uh, there are reasons why TBA is uh, quite uh, successful. And this is not to take away from its uh, success. Uh, they are a private company. They have worked very hard to make their business in India successful. But the reason why uh, their business picked up in a phenomenal way is because there was huge demand for transformers in India, which was not met by anyone. None of the global majors were catering to this sort of cheap, efficient transformers, uh, not of uh, high voltage, but uh, sort of India actually, most of Indian electricity grid operates at a much lower voltage uh, compared to international standards. So TBA saw this opportunity, and in a space of, I think, two to three years, Chinese uh, manufacturers got a huge market share in India, just by exporting it from China. So TBA smelt this opportunity and said, if we can sell so much sitting in China, if we establish a factory in India, we, our sales will go through the roof. And that's exactly what they did. And I think Gujarat government called them and gave them some land, made them happy, and off they went. So TBA is a good example. Uh, it's a true success. It's completely Chinese uh, made. I think, of course, they have a lot of Indian staff now, but the managers are still Chinese. So that's one case study I wanted to put across here. Uh, Huawei I've just put because no uh, story about Chinese investments in India is complete without Huawei. They have 7,000 employees, most of them Indians. Uh, and Huawei is actually, you know, they have uh, uh, eaten bitterness for 10 years before seeing success. From 1999 to, I think, 2006, 2007, their business was nothing to write home about. But today they're booking about $2 billion annual turnover in India. And uh, the person who transformed Huawei in India has been promoted and he now looks after Asia Pacific. Uh, his name is Yao Wei Ming. Uh, uh, until he moved to Bangkok, uh, he was a very familiar figure uh, in Delhi. And uh, he's really, you know, he, he's actually an academic, I think. He's got an academic background from uh, Cambridge and Oxford and he decided to come to India. So, so Huawei is uh, one more uh, case. Uh, they have done R&D, uh, they have recently announced a R&D facility in Bangalore, which is the second largest one outside uh, China. So, that's Huawei. Uh, so the significance of Huawei is actually, it creates a pool of Chinese managers who are familiar with India. I think that is the biggest contribution that Huawei does, apart from its own business. So, if you can get a Huawei manager, any Chinese company will hire them overnight. Uh, and uh, I don't think they are paid very well in Huawei. Uh, because Huawei is such a big company that they can't really incentivize a few people sitting in India. So, they continue to lose a lot of people. But there are more people coming in all the time. So, uh, they are quite okay with this attrition. They actually look at it as a contribution to building up Chinese investments in India. Uh, now I come to the post-Modi uh, uh, investments. Now, uh, there's been a huge uptick. It's huge in the sense that almost, uh, I can't say, maybe five times more investments in the last one year compared to one year before Modi came uh, from China. Uh, I don't know about other countries. And a lot of people say, oh, where are these investments? Like, I can't put a finger on it. And my normal answer is, you, you will never be able to put a finger on it because that is the whole point of these investments. Because if a Chinese company is seen as investing in an Indian company, 
the Indian company A will either lose its uh, branding and reputation because now it has become a Chinese company somehow. Uh, so uh, these are designed to be under the radar. They are private transactions. The only ones which are announced is where it's a greenfield investment. Like for example, this one was announced in a very big way. Uh, in a five star hotel in Delhi where Chandra Babu Naidu flew down to Delhi. Apparently this is the first time ever he's come to Delhi to announce a foreign investment in Andhra Pradesh because normally he likes to do it in Vijayawada or Hyderabad. So he came to Delhi and announced this. It's a, it's a one billion dollar announcement. Uh, but the first phase is about 1,670 crores, which is roughly 300 million dollars, to set up a 1,000 megawatt uh, module and panel plant in uh, uh, in Andhra Pradesh in a place called Sri City. And uh, the the Andhra Pradesh government threw in a freebie and said that we'll give you some land to set up a solar park. So they have a solar park uh, which will come up, I think, in the next two three years, which will absorb another. 3,000 crores of uh, investment, but the first stage is a module plant which is coming up. Uh, so, so this is just one story. In the same state, in Andhra Pradesh, there are two other players, GCL and uh, Trina. Trina is uh, China's biggest solar company. Uh, uh, both these companies are also uh, my clients. So, just among these three companies, the commitments are exceeding two billion dollars, but forget about the commitments because uh, people don't like to look at that. Actual investments in the first phase itself is close to a billion, collectively. So this is happening, uh, this is announced and the groundwork is happening. There are uh, dozens of engineers camping in India, you know, sort of measuring the land and digging the land and you know, doing things. So uh, this has taken about one one year, I would say, uh, from the time when they decided to look at India to the actual uh, sort of process of <coughs> investing. Uh, Trina is a different example because they have been bidding for solar uh, projects for a much longer time. In fact, the recent uh, bid, the unbelievable bid of uh, 4.63, which India has never seen before, uh, was a uh, direct result of competition between Sun Edison and uh, Trina. Uh, so the Andhra Pradesh government is very happy because they can achieve grid parity in less than two years if this trend continues. But there's a lot of doubt whether you can actually produce solar energy and make a profit if the price is 4.63 rupees a unit. So uh, anyway, so these are some of the case studies. There are many more. Uh, your question, you asked me which is the listed company. The listed company is called Layard. Layard is the Chinese listed company which invested in an Indian listed company called MIC in Hyderabad. It's in the LED segment. MIC is famous for uh, having the Narendra Modi's uh, holograph. When he was making speeches, he used this technology where he could simultaneously be projected in uh, multiple locations. Uh, so the company which supplied that uh, service was MIC. So Layard is a leading uh, Chinese LED player which has uh, bought a 11% <coughs> stake in MIC. Uh, so this is not the first uh, public m and but this is one of the very few public m and that have happened between India and India. <coughs> and the reason for that was also technology because uh, MIC is very strong in uh, certain types of LED products and uh, layer has capabilities in a different range. So the combination will actually produce a wide uh, portfolio of LED products which will save electricity and you know, more efficiency and all of that. So that's the plan. And uh, you mentioned so uh, base antennas. So we recently did an interesting uh, deal. Uh, it's a private transaction, so I won't take names. But it was a Chinese company uh, which has technology for uh, cellular base antennas. And uh, the Indian company is a listed Indian company uh, which uh, sought out this Chinese company for the technology they have. So in the morning when you said, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a technical person, but uh, in the morning when you said Chinese company, never have technology for base antennas. I was a little surprised because this transaction was all about base antennas. And I learned a lot about uh, <laughs> base antennas because of that. What so, the cellular market? Yeah, it's for the cellular market. And I think some of the new base antennas can now be seen. Yeah. For well, the first time you see a different type of cellular towers in uh, Delhi at least. Uh, not those ugly, ugly structures, 
but a single elegant mask and everything uh, located on it. Uh, clearly, this is a stage of transition for India. The, the antennas that I spoke about are <coughs> very, very miniature in nature. For example, in a phone, there will be six antennas. Okay. There's an antenna for Bluetooth, there's an antenna for NFC, there's an antenna for GPS, that we can keep on adding it. So, that antenna's development skill is extremely niche. Okay. Maybe, I mean, this is a wild uh, market. But anyway, what I was trying to say is, this was a very good, uh, the Chinese embassy was extremely happy. happy. Because, you know, there was this Indian listed company which uh, is quite reputed. And they went and sought out this Chinese company and said, we do a JV where you put in nothing. You put in nothing. You just walk in and you get a 50% stake and we will bear the cost of development and going to market and everything. And we will bankroll the entire operation. You just need to come in and put in your technology. So those guys were extremely happy. And the ministry... Was listed company maybe? Yeah. But I'll tell you the downside of it now. So on the day the public announcement happened, and uh, I worked on this deal, right? So even, it took me even me by surprise. There was a press conference in Bombay, and in the morning at 10 o'clock or something. So at 11 o'clock on my phone, that uh, news thing flashed. And I saw that the announcement was uh, this Indian company has done a joint venture with a New Zealand company. So <laughs> it was fantastic. And I said, like, how did this happen? <laughs> so then. <laughs> They, they, they are, so this is a tragedy of India-China investment because this Indian listed company, if it says, if it makes an announcement, if it puts it out to the stock exchange saying, we have done a JV with a Chinese company for base antennas, even the customers might not like it. You know, the Airtels and uh, Idea, who are the customers for this product, may not like it. So they made an announcement as saying, we have done a JV with a New Zealand company. And this company has nothing in New Zealand. <laughs> No, no, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what happened. So the, the owner of the company has a New Zealand passport. So he <laughs> emigrated to New Zealand and he has obviously created some company, shell company in New Zealand to manage his investments in New Zealand. So they did something, some, some, uh, some documentation saying, okay, now this company actually is controlled by this New Zealand company because the chairman of this company is a... 100% shareholder of the New Zealand. Who sleeps there one day a month? <laughs> so, so th this is the thing. So the announcement finally came as a New Zealand and India JV. The China nowhere uh, mentioned. Because this company's production facilities are in Shenzhen. The offices are in uh, Guangzhou and Hong Kong. But hey, so this is an interesting uh, story of how things pan out. Uh, one question. Uh, in recent news, uh, Ali, uh, Yahoo actually has a 30 billion, 32 billion stake in Alibaba yeah. and they actually wanted to spin off that stake but you know that has actually failed so can you, you know, just explain like what were the legal aspects and you know, why it actually failed? Yeah so Yahoo and Alibaba have had a very interesting relationship which has gone from sort of uh, bitter enemies to good friends and back and forth. So the reason is Alibaba when it was going, it needed capital and uh, Yahoo was unable to crack the Chinese market. So they sort of became shareholders saying we will use Alibaba. And Alibaba used Yahoo for whatever it was worth. They milked it completely saying it's an international internet company and they are our major stakeholders so we will grow and you know, they, they basically used the reputation of Yahoo to gain uh, brand recall and all kinds of things. And then there was a stage where the Chinese government said that uh, if you have a foreign stakeholder, there are certain things you cannot do or might be problematic. So then they distanced themselves from Yahoo. In fact, Alibaba is, I mean, if you ask uh, Yahoo fans, they'll say, you know, uh, this guy Jack Ma is a crook because everything that makes money, he did it in a different company because in the main entity, there was Yahoo sitting there. But actually, it was not by plan because he was forced to. So this Ant Financial Services or whatever, that's the investment company of Alibaba. So this is a story. So there was a time when Alibaba needed Yahoo a lot and Yahoo needed Alibaba a lot. But then they moved apart and then Yahoo, today I think Yahoo is a shade of what it could have been. At some point Yahoo was you know, much bigger than Google obviously and then there were competitors to Google and now they are like nowhere. So, uh, yeah, so that's the history. I mean, I, this is what I know about it. I've never worked on anything related to Alibaba or Yahoo. So, 
so yeah, so I can I can spend the rest of the day with case studies. How, how do these companies manage with the labor union? Get to tea time quite soon. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think I'll stop. Labor unions, how do they manage the labor unions? Uh, India, because you know. T, T, okay, let me talk one by one. Sinoma, uh, they acquired a stake in the Indian company. So the Indian uh, manager, the owner of the company who made a lot of money, still continues to operate the company as CEO. Uh, so that's how they manage it. The Indian management still controls the company and manages the labor. TBA is completely Chinese owned. So they have managers from China, but they have recruited operational guys from India to manage their factories. The Chinese people mainly pay attention to sales and, you know, that kind of uh, not uh, dealing with labor type of issues. Uh, Huawei, uh, I think it's almost Indian because they have 6,000 Indian employees, so all uh, managers are Indian. So they have very few. In fact, they bring young Chinese people from China to expose them to the Indian market. They don't really try to control the Indian entity with Chinese managers. So they are almost you know, localized. Longji uh, are desperately looking for Chinese managers right now. In fact, I introduced them to one candidate who is, there's one Chinese uh, girl who has married an Indian doctor and is studying in ISB. So I introduced them to her and Longji is now uh, kind of uh, trying to recruit her. So yeah, so for Greenfield projects, it's a big challenge. So HR is the biggest challenge. Recruitment is the biggest challenge. So the day they announce an investment, they start looking for talent. They need at least 10, 15 managers to start a $300 investment. So this is a big challenge, which is why I was saying that this is why I think uh, this course can play a very important role because <coughs> Indian students who have done a management degree and have some knowledge of China or have visited China or stayed in China, I think they will fit the bill of most of these Chinese companies because that is much better than what they can get right now. And after I was invited to come here, even I became aware of this program. And in the last two months, I have mentioned this course to a number of Chinese companies and their eyes pop up. Is there a program like this? Uh, we have no idea. So I think uh, this is just a, a golden opportunity. I think we need to find some way of exposing this course to Chinese companies. And I think they will, uh, a lot of their uh, talent issues will, can be resolved. I have a question because yeah. of this talent issue you are saying. Yeah. There is something about talent strategy in China. Yeah. What's that? What's that so, isn't this, this is designed to have a problem because in China you don't face that problem. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you go outside China. Yeah. You don't face that problem because you are not habituated to tackle that problem and you don't. Yes, I think you are right. HR is a constant problem with Chinese companies everywhere. But in India, I think the differences are there is no overseas Chinese population. So that normally fixes this problem, okay, or that is the solution for this problem. So how much it fixes, I don't know, but that is uh, that is non-existent in India. So in India, they are at a complete loss. And, and in most other countries in the world, of significance, there is a watch out, there is a OC Chinese population. Uh, I'm sorry, there's one small role played by government regulations here, because we can't give employment visas to people who earn less than $25,000. And a lot of these Chinese companies, they would like to bring in you know, these kind of interns or freshers because you know, it's resource heavy. They would like to have 50 people paid very low salaries in the initial stages because the business is not making money. So they don't want to spend like a lot of money sending senior managers in the initial stages. And that can't happen in India because we need to pay at least $25,000 as salary to get an employment visa. So this, is, I mean, this also plays a small role. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I was making notes from yesterday. All the things that were sort of referred to me saying, Santosh will deal with this, Santosh will deal with this. <laughs> it's become like a big list. Uh, so maybe we can do that uh, offline or something. Uh, because now it's past two. I think now I'll start getting uh, uh, Kali's if I continue. So <laughs> we'll just break for lunch. And questions also, I can, I'm happy to take more questions in a different session. Thank you. Thank you.
have listened to the discussions? Sure. It's a great now it's on I'm your head. <laughs> I'm happy to go and continue. A minute, a minute to, to both the discussions and then we can continue with the questions and bring back the questions for lunch. Because we'll close your name over. So sure, also sure. not feeling. Well, we'll not do justice to you. No, 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 that's okay. I, I, I just wanted to say questions that are going to be there. We would, we, we, we would need sure. uh, that. But Let's the discussions promise to keep it to one minute. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I'll be very brief because uh, the questions I were uh, having, many of them are addressed. So, uh, a few quick points you may not respond, that is just for uh, the purpose of discussion. Okay. Okay. So, um, talking about Chinese investment in India, in India so just uh, Couple of days back, this uh, Mumbai Ahmedabad bullet train was, I mean, decided that Japanese will beat now. So uh, it was like a marginal, by marginal amount, they have won the bid. So uh, I'm just trying to highlight this perception issue, sure. as you are uh, also telling about this, that although cultural differences are not. Uh, very high in terms of numbers, but uh, two things like one is management style and another is uh, 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 the people's perception. So, uh, if you look at the comments after this news, people say that, uh, I mean, these are anonymous comments, so some people say, excellent, no need of Chinese junk. So, I mean, this, this highlights how Indians perceive Chinese investment and also. One more comment just to add to that. Uh, it says bit rivalry is good, but in general, India should trust Japan more than China, and all preferences should be to Japan if price differences are not huge factor. So uh, we can see uh, even uh, in other places, Chinese Japanese rivalry is appearing, even though they are not directly competing among themselves. So. Uh, this is about uh, answer aspect, but two more quick points. Uh, like uh, my, I mean, uh, academic work also pertains to this outward update from developing countries, and in that I have looked at even Chinese investment, Indian investment. So uh, from there we can see many challenges Chinese companies faces over uh, all over the world, and that is known to all of us. But uh, like for example, they say faces challenges because of corporate governance issues, state ownership of their companies, and private companies uh, are having different set of challenges because they don't have that easy access to finance and other things. So, uh, how they are addressing these issues when they are coming to say India? Uh, and uh, lastly, um, the point about. Uh, uh, incorporating these challenges in their investment strategy, how they are addressing those. You have mentioned some of the ways, but uh, what are the ways they are addressing these challenges? And uh, because you are looking at China to India, uh, I would be also interested in the challenges Indian companies are facing in China. So if you have any sure. light to throw on that. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good questions. I will address them as quickly as possible. The first one is a great one. Uh, CSR and CNR have recently merged. So uh, these are you know, two different train companies. They have become one. They have been trying to penetrate the Indian market for quite a while. And the first setback they actually suffered was Bombardier setting up a plant in India. So that was actually the first blow they suffered. And Japanese loans have always been a big factor uh, because uh, Japan needs an uh, avenue for their uh, technology as well. But uh, let's look at it a balance. I've visited the CSR factory in uh, China and so have you know, many other uh, railway officials. 150 railway officials have visited China. So what happens is, let's look at India. Uh, if we really want to have a nationwide network of high-speed trains, is not going to happen with Japanese technology. The cost is too high and uh, safety record is a concern. Uh, Chinese, I think, uh, train system has had one uh, major crash. 
uh, I think that's what the newspaper cited yesterday when I was reading that and they said the Vanjo crash cost them this bit because otherwise it was very compelling. So the test is, this is the first one, okay the Japanese got it, there will be a second one which the Japanese might get it but if we actually need a network across India of high speed train like how we have in uh, China at some point of time the Chinese will come into play whether they get a market share of 20% or 30% or 50% they will have to share this market with the Japanese. Now it up, it's up to Indian ambitions about how many, how or how soon we want to implement this high speed train in India because we can't do it relying only on Japan. That's not going to happen. Japan will not bankroll uh, the entire network across India. But if India is very happy to only connect Ahmedabad and Bombay or Bombay and Delhi and say rest of the country we don't need high speed trains, that is possible. But if we actually need to roll it out across the country like how China has done, then CSR will get orders. So that, that goes without saying. Uh, so it's up to our comfort issue and they'll keep trying. So that's all I can say. So this is just the first bit. I don't think it's that big a setback. Uh, the second point was corporate governance. Uh, so there was an interesting time when Chinese companies were listing in the US through reverse mergers. Reverse mergers are basically shell companies which you can acquire and then reverse merge into them to get a listing very easy. And in the last two years, all of them were delisted because of corporate governance concerns in the US. So right now in China, <coughs> the regulators, the, the Chinese Securities Exchange is very concerned about corporate governance, even for the domestic market. So there was a blanket ban on listings for about one and a half years in China because of this. So there were no listings allowed because the Chinese government wanted to send a very strong signal to Chinese companies saying if you are listed either in China or overseas, get your books in shape before you do that, otherwise it's costing the Chinese uh, government a lot of uh, reputation. So that is one way the government is addressing it and it's working. A lot of these uh, fictitious companies are either folding down or reforming themselves. It will take some time but they have put that plan into motion. The third point you made was how are Chinese companies addressing these concerns of perception in India. So they are doing this by A, disguising themselves as completely uh, either Singaporean companies or New Zealand companies or whatever it is. And that actually suits the Indian companies as well because it's, it's an industry issue. It's not just about India and China. If they want to do well in the Indian market, they need to do that. But that's delaying the problem. That is delaying the problem, but what, uh, see now, uh, for example, Xiaomi uh, uh, now has, I think, resolved it in the mobile phone industry at least. It's a beginning. Uh, now, Johnny and uh, all these, uh, they're piggybacking on Xiaomi. So, Xiaomi was the first one. Chinese uh, phones are junk. They sold 1 million uh, phone sets in 6 months. So, now they are cleared of the space. So, that will happen in each space. So. For the B2B industry, this is not a big concern. Because even the biggest steel companies and the cement companies in India will vouch for cement plant, I mean Chinese plants. So this is a concern only in the B2C segment. But the example you gave of Tanjana, yeah. that's a B2B. Yeah, that's a B2B, but uh, that, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, there is a little bit of that concern because, you know, because the end customers are facing consumers. So Airtel or a... Uh, idea or reliance who buys these antennas is facing the consumer. So they don't want any sort of backlash from the reputational kind of risk. So there is some kind of an impact there. But if it's a pure beauty B, like a cement, like if you're buying cement, you don't really care whether it was manufactured by Ambuja Cements in a factory which was built by the Chinese or whether it was built by F.S. Smith from uh, Germany. Uh, from Germany. So that will actually, you know, so the, what they're doing basically is they're going under the radar and just saying, let's flood the Indian market with all our products mm -hmm. without even the Indians knowing it. And then they will realize that if we don't have our products, mm -hmm. like how in the US, if you remove everything that is made in China from a US home, you'll have nothing left. <laughs> so that is eventually happening here. Yeah. In, the, in the US context, Chinese brands have not been it's outsourcing this. So I think that you are not comfortable. But what I'm wondering is whether the Chinese companies, as, as a group or with support from the government, uh, is considering some kind of a 
corporate image building, country image building exercises? They should, and in fact, this is exactly what I said. When the, there is a new law which mandated these people to spend on CSR, so my yeah CSR C, yeah CSR. No, I I know it's not strictly CSR, but uh, I I told the Chinese embassy and the Chinese company this is a good way for you to build your image, do a little bit of charity. It's anyway required under law in India, so you have to spend two percent of your turnover anyway uh, to comply with Indian laws. So this is a good way to build your image. So that will happen, but the way the Chinese see it is that it's a limitation on the Indian side that we have put on blinkers and we insist on sort of associating That's China because with China. They cheap. are consumer focused. Exactly. Yes. So because Chinese companies think eventually, you know, India is a very price sensitive market. Eventually, Indians will get off their uh, high horses and say that you know we can afford Chinese quality and this is what we want. We don't admit it. But uh, the Indian market is like that. I was running uh, last morning and I saw Vivo mobiles posters are all around in Shillong. And Vivo is an out and out Chinese company which is you know spending money on marketing and you know, overcoming that. Sorry. I am Suresh Kumar. I am the IPS officer with the BSI by 19. Just a point. I work with the UN and Africa. So every parliament building looks the same. Yeah. So when I talk to my boss, he's British. They are all built for the Chinese. When yeah. they enter the African country, they build a parliament house, the yeah. Tripur Stadium, yeah. the Chinese hospital. Yeah. It's all start. Yes. And then they start buying the entire country. Yes. And I think one trick they play, more than 50% of investors, they are fairly diplomats. Uh -huh. They are businessmen given their post for five years, they come out to the tax of tools. That's what I heard from the system, sir. With respect, that is not true. China only appoints professionals as its ambassadors. But sir, what I heard from the UN system was only that they are aggressively pushing the business. I you studied it for many years, please believe that. Uh, okay, th that point aside, uh, I think this construction of uh, buildings is a very time-tested way of making African countries happy. And typically, you're right, it's either a guest house or it's a president's... No, that's uh, everywhere, that's in America also. Yeah, yeah, th that's everywhere. That has not happened in India, so that's a good thing. Uh, Indian government has never allowed uh, them to sort of build government buildings here. Uh, although, right now, I must say that uh, Amravati, uh, in uh, the new capital of uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, there's a Singaporean company which is doing the design and consulting and all of that. And there are, I would say, quite a few Chinese companies in the fray uh, to bid for these various buildings and various infrastructure that will be constructed. But that is not a freebie. Uh, they are participating in the tender. They are giving inputs into the design process so that when it's eventually announced, it will be something that they are good at. They have already done. So apart from this, there have been no instances of government infrastructure being built by uh, Chinese companies. So that I, I would say that's a good thing because it could have easily happened that if India was a different country, uh, that could have been there. So well, the second discussion wants to make you over lunch. <laughs> <laughs>